Amen. Amen. Joshua chapter 9, look at verse 21 there, the Bible says, And the princes said unto them, Let them leave, but let them be hewers of wood and drawers of water unto all the congregation, as the princes had promised them. And Joshua called for them, and he spake unto them, saying, Wherefore have ye beguiled us, saying, We are very far from you, when ye dwell among us? Now therefore ye are cursed, and there shall none of you be freed from being bondmen, and hewers of wood, and drawers of water, for the house of my God. The title of my sermon this morning is, The Bondage of Perpetual Welfare. The Bondage of Perpetual Welfare. Welfare, she say. Now, this is another interesting story in the Bible. Uh, we're studying the book of Second Samuel, so there's a whole bunch of interesting stories that we, we can learn from. And I'm just drawing out uh, the bondage of perpetual welfare from this story. I mean, there are other things I could teach about it, but um, when I read this story, I see the curse of welfare system, just being in welfare and submitting yourself and just, oh yeah, I'm at your mercy. This is, they used worldly wisdom. People of Gibeon used worldly wisdom to avoid destruction. Open to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. The land of Gibeon was part of the inheritance of Israel promised by God to Israel. So God commanded that Israel should wipe them out and possess the land. The Gibeonites were part of the Am Amorites. So just one of the cities in, in the land of the Amorites. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 7 verse 1, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hevites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou, and when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shall, thou shalt not give unto his, unto his son, nor his daughter, daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their grooves and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Open to chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 20. So this command is different from just going to fight foreign nations. God was talking about people living in, in those lands, those seven great nations with all those cities, uh, usually just called the land of the, uh, of the Canaanites. But uh, those seven great nations, God wanted them to utterly destroy them, kill everything that breathes, and possess the land. Now, other nations, other foreign nations, if at all they go to battle, there's a way they deal with them. They're supposed to try to make peace with them. Then if not, um, attack them. Then reserve some people. And I'll show you that. It says in Deuteronomy 20, if you're there in verse 10, talking about when Israel goes to war. But I want to cut straight to the point here. In verse 10 it says, When thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. So you came to fight against a city, whether it's God has sent you to fight against the city or for any other reason, obviously it's a justified battle, a righteous war. So you proclaim peace first. This is not the nations that God gave them to possess. Verse 11, And it shall be, if it make the answer of peace and open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. So this is how you make servants of foreign nations, of other nations. Verse 12, and, and if it will make no peace with thee, but will make war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. That is, because he's not opening his gate, so you siege, there'll be a siege on it. Verse 13, and when the Lord thy God had delivered it into thine hand, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. But the women and the little ones and the cattle and all that is in the city, even all the spoil thereof, shalt thou take unto thyself. Thou shalt eat Thou shalt eat the spoil of thine enemies, which the Lord thy God had given thee. Thou shalt 
thus shalt thou do unto all the cities which are very far from thee. Uh, sorry, very far off from thee, which are not of the cities of these nations. I already read those nations in chapter 7. But of the cities, including Gibeon, but of the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save a life nothing that breatheth. That means even the men, the little ones, everything. But thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, Hevites, Jebusites, as the Lord thy God had commanded thee, that that they teach you not to do after all the abominations which they have done unto their gods, so should ye sin against the Lord your God. So don't think these people were just some innocent people, or Gibeonites were innocent. No, they were doing abominations. Do you know what kind of abominations? I mean, all the, the, the I mean, abominations. <laughs> I don't want to start listening to them, but the sexual abominations, uh, sodomy, uh, Keep killing their children, submitting it to Molech, bestiality. I mean, just think of all the abominations they were doing. And that's why God wanted to wipe all of them away. Every single one of them. So the Gibeonites believed that they had no chance against Israel. They said they know the word of the Lord. They know what God commanded Moses concerning them. And they decided to deceive the Israelites and go into a covenant with them. So they knew exactly what the word of the Lord was but they deceived the Israelites they entered into a covenant and Israel you know swearing unto the Lord so they cannot go back on that covenant so they are using the knowledge of how Israel serves their God to against Israel so because Joshua did not go and seek the face of the Lord before entering this covenant Anyway, this story is a picture of people knowingly entering the bondage of perpetual welfare. They say, we are your servants. Forever, we'll be your servants. So, those that abuse the welfare system in this country is a picture of them. Now, what is welfare? Welfare is the state of doing well, right? The well-being or the prosperity of a person. The welfare system that I'm talking about refers to government programs, so it's for families and individuals that cannot afford a decent standard of living. Now, what is decent? Decent, you know, could vary, but uh, it depends on the situation. But a decent standard of living. So what does welfare program include? It includes housing, food, medical care, financial assistance of different kinds. And this is the welfare system that I'll be referring to for, for the most part when I'm talking about this sermon. So when I say welfare, I'm talking about the programs that this country is providing for people that cannot afford to have a decent standard of living. Now, just a few statistics about welfare. I'm not going to go too deep from, from the, so much of the past. But the welfare spending in 2023, so last year, $70 billion on unemployment. $70 billion on employment, $124 billion on housing, $147 billion on food and nutrition, $208 billion in what is called other income. So that could include supplementary security uh, income for seniors or disabled or child support, supplementary nutrition for weak, that is women, infants, and children, Food nutrition programs, this includes even uh, food served in school, that is school breakfast, school lunch, child, as, child care assistance, uh, refugee assistance, low income energy assistance, so just different kinds of financial aids or other income, $208 billion. Now, $756 billion on Medicaid. Medicaid is different from Medicare. So sometimes we confuse, or sometimes I used to confuse it, like Medicaid, Medicare, what is that? Okay, Medicare is a social insurance program. It's not a welfare program. It's a social insurance program. It's a federal healthcare insurance for the elderly for 65 years and above. Then you qualify for Medicare. That's Medicare. Now, Medicaid is a social welfare program that is health insurance for those with limited income and resources. It's also not meant to be permanent. This is like a stopgap kind of thing, so it should not be abused. But people just abuse it. They enter perpetual bondage in the welfare system. So in total, about $1.3 trillion spent, that is the ones that they can calculate, basically, 
trillion dollars spent last year. Now, just uh, to help you understand, 2022, that was two years ago, due to COVID, it was $1.6 trillion spent in 2022. I'm just trying to show you how much you know, is being spent on welfare. Now, 70 million people are, were on Social Security Admi Administration, that is welfare programs, in the United States in 2021. In 2022, 81 million people were enrolled in Medicaid, that is about 25% of the population. 41 million people received food stamps. I mean, it's crazy what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to show you numbers that welfare system is just growing, it's crazy, there's so much money being spent, which was not the idea of, of welfare system. Now, I have some problems in welfare system according to what I understand from the Bible. And I'm gonna discuss five problems that are about the welfare systems. Number one, welfare, rewards laziness. The welfare system rewards laziness. The so-called free resources, nothing is free. Somebody worked for it, <laughs> somebody's paying for it. But the so-called free resources, they don't encourage the people to find work or the people to get out of that system. So they become lazy, they become idle. And uh, now, I know you say, oh, there's this guy, I know they are the exceptions and people just happen to be in a bad state. But I'm talking about in general. Right? So they become lazy, they become idle, and uh, the unemployment benefits, it's, it makes people not want to work. First of all, in their businesses or in their offices or whatever they're doing, they don't care about the work. They, they don't take it seriously because if they get fired, what's gonna happen? Unemployment. They get un unemployment, so there's a safety net under them. So they're lazy at their work, they don't take it seriously. And if they get fired too, they are lazy and idle, they don't look for work, oh, I have unemployment for, what, two months? Then they'll try to look for work, just show the guy, oh yeah, I've been looking for work, there's no work. Then they'll refile for unemployment again, refile for unemployment. Like, then after a while, they go into homelessness, they get all the housing, get this, get that. Like, it just makes people lazy and idle. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 10, verse, uh, verse four, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent make it rich. So you, they start dealing with slack hands and they become poor and they enter into the welfare system and they continue in the world. It's just a perpetual bondage that they put themselves in. And God hates laziness. Everybody he uses. I like Amos. Amos, Amaziah came to Amos and said, and told Amos, uh, you're a prophet, stop prophesying in Israel. You know, Jeroboam is gonna kill you. Just go to Judah, hide there and prophesy. Amos is like, I'm not a prophet. I'm not a son of a prophet. I'm a shepherd. I was just doing my business and God called me and told me to say these things. And because you said this now, your wife is gonna be a harlot. I mean, this is in the Bible. <laughs> so Amos is just doing his business, just working hard. I mean, look at Elisha, the same thing, working hard. God did not call the seven prophets, uh, 7,000 men that did not bow the, bow, uh, bend the knee to bow. Instead, he called Elijah, somebody that is working hard. Anyway, laziness can just be a whole sermon on its own. But it becomes a state of mind, the poverty. A state of mind, and that is the perpetual bondage that they put themselves in. So people living in poverty, and especially in a country like this, where there's opportunities everywhere, you can easily live above the poverty line. Easily. But you see the places with poverty line, you see the cars parked next to all those houses. You're like, wow. What are they doing with the money they, that they have? And they will now file for welfare, file for this. So you can easily live above the poverty line and not qualify for welfare, unless you made some serious mistakes in your youth, right? Or for example, if you're a criminal, then you kind of limit your resources. Now it doesn't mean you cannot live above the poverty line, it just means you work harder. That's what it means. You made some mistakes in your youth, then work harder. And your life is supposed to be an example for others to see and fear, as the Bible says, hear and fear, I guess. Proverbs 18, verse 9 says, He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. So you see that with welfare, they just waste the things that are given to them because they didn't work hard for it because they are slothful. That means they are lazy. So lazy people are wasters. They don't value those things. All right, the second problem I see with the welfare system is welfare attacks the institution of marriage. They attack the institution of marriage. Thereby, they are destroying families. Welfare gives financial incentives for couples to remain unmarried. What do I mean? There are higher benefits given to single mothers. 
single mothers have higher benefits so therefore if you have a child with this person and that person and that person you get different child care services different welfare child support alimony this i mean so they just destroy marriages destroy families many women raising or many single mothers out there and they don't mind as their child is getting closer to 18 they want to have another child they want to have another child just so that they can continue getting the money and um, remain on the welfare system of different kinds so i remember oh no i remember i read <laughs> in 1964 president johnson President Johnson, uh, he, uh, he, he declared during the, I remember because you know watched it, but he declared during the um, State of Union, therefore, State of Union address, he said, there's gonna be a war on poverty. You know, all these declarations of war. <laughs> you know, war on the virus, the invisible enemy, war on this, war on that, it's just a way of just spending money. Anyway, so a war on poverty, and he took the welfare system and just exploded it. Just gave people just so much money. Just, because a war on poverty, nobody should be poor. When Jesus said, that, in fact, I'm going ahead of myself, but they do, there'll be the poor always among us, right? But he, he declared a war on poverty because, you know, he's nicer than Jesus Christ, right? So that increased the expenditure in the welfare system and studies have shown that this program contributed to the poverty in the country so he's fighting a war on poverty but gets ends up putting people in perpetual welfare system and more people are joining the welfare system so and where it showed is especially in the family unit. According to the CDC, the percentage of black babies born to unmarried mothers rose from 11% when the New Deal welfare programs began in 1935, and welfare started, you know, the Great Depression, all of that. Anyway, the New Deal uh, program, and the wars, anyway. The New Deal program started in 1935. So it rose from 11% to 70% black babies that are born. Now, that is in 2018, sorry, from 1960 uh, something, sorry, 35, when it started, then the uh, war on poverty just blew it up to 70% in 2018. Now, white babies from 3% to 28%. So you see how much it affected those that just wanted welfare, wanted free stuff, rep reparations, and all of that. Then Biden did not help with the Build Back Better plan it's another welfare system that we are going to see the consequences later on due to the shutdowns that they caused or they made. They forced, I should say. Anyway, let's look at point number three. Point number three, why I think the welfare system is a problem. Welfare makes the government become a father, a master, and yeah, even a god. That's what the welfare system does. People, the people in that system, they totally depend on the government for everything. Right? So people think that the next president to save them, oh, my student loans, or my this, or my that, oh, we need this, we need that. Government, government, government is now their master, is now their father, he teaches them what to do, everything. Yeah, they even worship them. Oh, yeah, he's, he's such good. I mean, look at what they say about Kamala right now. Oh, she's so great, she's so great, she does all this, she does all that. Okay, name one good thing she has done. Nothing. They can't name anything that she has done. But she's so great. This is what children do with their parents. Their parents are the best. The strongest, the greatest. They can do everything. <laughs> right? That's how they take uh, the government, the people in the welfare system. So instead of doing that with their parents or with God or their boss at work, but everything is government. They don't care about their boss at work. They don't care about their parents. They don't care about God. It's just the government. The government is what feeds them, clothes them. If something is wrong with the government, oh, they are, they are in a serious problem, right? They will go and protest and, you know, just see, must get right, we need this. Because the government is their God. Another problem with the welfare system is that, that's point number four, welfare makes working hard appear foolish. So if you're working hard and there's a welfare system going on, you look foolish at the end, or like, as time goes on, you're like, why am I working hard? This is not smart. Maybe I should just go get free stuff too, instead of working hard. So it undermines working to earn a living, right? People are in a bad spot, you're like, your colleagues are just going to the welfare system, getting money or getting food stamps or anything you're getting, and you are trying to work hard and you're like, 
I should just forget about trying to work hard and suffer. I might as well just go to welfare system. Welfare is giving me a thousand dollars. I don't know how much how much they give, but welfare is giving me a thousand dollars. I'm working and I'm earning one thousand two hundred. Man, I just forget about the $200 and have free time. Or I have to just line up, sign up, get my check, and move on. So that's what, that's what people are doing, and it makes working hard look foolish. See, man is made to work. The first commandment God gives man is to work. I know, it seems like it is be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. How is this supposed to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth? He was speaking to man and woman. That's just a summary of what happened, executive summary. When God made man, he put man in the garden, and in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 2, he said, And the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. See, I made you, guess what? Get to work. <laughs> I made the garden, I made everything. So we have everything made for us. We just have to work. You saw that's Old Testament. That was in your old world, Old Testament. Old. New Testament, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any should not work, neither should he eat. It is that serious. Say, so if you don't work, that means I will not eat. Yes. You can just, oh, I'm not working. I'm just going to be getting welfare. That's a problem with the welfare system. It goes against the word of God. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 27 says, It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. You're supposed to work. So, see, because it, it starts leading to communism, right? And communism does not encourage working hard, right? When it starts, there's all this free stuff because people are working, right? Then the next generation, they become smarter. They're like, I'm not going to work. When everybody's going to get the same thing, <laughs> right? I want to get the same thing. Next generation, they want more free stuff. And guess what happens? Free stuff runs out eventually because free stuff does not drop from the sky. Somebody works for it. <laughs> so free stuff runs out and then they see, they realize the chains and the bondage that they put themselves into. All right. Uh, so problems with the welfare system, it rewards laziness, attacks the institution of marriage, thereby destroying families, uh, makes the government the father, the master, or the boss, and a god to them, and it makes working hard look foolish. It undermines hard work to earn a living. Then, last point, point number five, welfare creates a false sense of equality. Now, I'm going to develop this one a little bit. Open to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17. All men are not on the same level. All men are not equal in that sense. In every aspect of life, people are different. Physically, yeah, even spiritually, people are different. From the outward appearance even to the inward reality, if you want to put it that way. See, as believers, we are called in all these different levels. God understands the diversities that we have. People are different. I mean, they, he talks about the weak weak conscience, people weak in the faith, talk about different levels of faith. So this is spiritually. And God understands that we're also in different economical status. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17, But as God had distributed to every man, as the Lord had called everyone, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all churches, is any man be sorry? Is any man called being circumcised? That means you were saved, but you're already a Jew. I mean, you're a Jew, you're circumcised, and you got saved. Is anyone called being circumcised? Let him, let him not become uncircumcised. I don't even know how that works, but that's what the Bible says. <laughs> let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. That's what Galatians preaches also. Verse 19, circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Verse 20, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called, and thou call being a servant, care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be ye not, sorry, be not ye serve this, the servants of men, brethren. Let every man wherein he is called, therein abide with God. So we're all called at different levels. Spiritually, physically, God is showing us that 
So stay in your nationality, whether it's circumcision, that's what he's just trying to say. Stay in your nationality, your culture, all of that. Just don't be servants of man. Don't follow traditions of man over the traditions of God. Don't follow traditions of man against the word of God. Don't be deceived by philosophies and all of that. So, you know, you're bought with a price. Be not, or be ye not, uh, sorry, be not ye the servants of men. So, we're called in different economical levels too. Now, don't on, on misunderstand me or misunderstand this verse in Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 I'll read it it says there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither bond nor free there is neither male nor female for ye are all one in Christ yes we are all equal in Christ as I said if you're called when you, as a bond man you're free in Christ if you're called um, uh, as a free person you're a servant to Christ, right? So we're all equal in Christ, in the, in the eyes of God. Yes, we're all equal, but God understands our different levels physically and our different levels spiritually as part of the levels of faith. So it does not mean that God is saying we're all economically equal. And this is why God said, condescend to men of low estate. I mean, it's looked at as a bad thing. Oh, he's condescending. Oh, he's condescending. But God says condescend. To men of low estate. That means take aside your dignities, your titles, all your rights and everything, and put yourself equal to men of lower estate. He's talking to the church. So we're not all equal. <laughs> but welfare system makes it look like, oh, we're all equal. Everybody uh, just receive, we should all receive a, a certain level, and that's it. Uh, and the, the person of law say, oh, doesn't look at, doesn't understand that there are different levels. So we're supposed to treat ourselves like that in church. In Philippians chapter 2, it says, you know, esteem others higher than yourselves. In James chapter 2, the same thing, don't be partial. Don't treat the one who comes in with the gay clothing. I'm saying that so you remember the verse. But gay means flashy, nice looking, all of that. Don't, we should not be respecters of person, persons. All right. Jesus also said, as, as I said earlier, ye have the poor always with you. This was when uh, Judas Iscariot was wanted to take the money that was spent on Jesus Christ. Anyway, ye have the poor always with you. So don't be deceived by communism. That is e equality and equity, meaning equal outcome. It's not just giving people equal opportunities, but ensuring that the outcome is equal. We're not, everyone is not all equal. That's not how God called us. We don't have to all be equal, right? So that was never the intention of God when it comes to welfare. Yes, we have equal right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have equal rights to it, right? I can't say, oh, yeah, you don't have enough rights to that, according to... But, every, yes, people start from different levels, different situations, right? Our actions determine our outcome, the actions that we have. You commit murder, guess what? You, you lose that right to life. It's as simple as that. You can say, oh, no, he has a right to life. <laughs> no, you lose that right to life, according to the word of God. You go into debt. You, you, the, the borrower, sorry, yeah, the borrower is servant to the lender, right? You go into debt, you lose your right to liberty. <laughs> it's as simple as that. You lose that right. Oh, we have equal right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. To people, different things make all our happinesses are not equal. It's as simple as that. So, some benefits of leaving the welfare uh, system out of the hands of the government is that the government is not seen to be thanked. People that get the welfare check, who do they thank? Who, who, how did, uh, no gratitude. So who do they thank? Guess what? They're supposed to be thanking everybody they see because everybody contributed. <laughs> but they don't thank those people. They in fact insult those people. Because the government is like some mysterious god. Oh, you just pray to the government, show up, the government gives you money. So people will have more respect for each other if it is done the God's way. If the government is not the one doing the welfare. So if they help and are helped by each other, they will have respect for each other. People will show more gratitude. People will have dignity. What do I mean? I'm talking about positively, people have dignity. Now if you want to look at it negatively, people have pride, right? As far, don't you respect yourself? <laughs> right? You respect yourself more. Because imagine if every month, brother child, I'm coming to you for money. Every month. At a certain point, my pride <laughs> would tell me, okay, this month I, I should look for work. I can't be coming to Brother Chad every month. But if it is the government, who cares? It has no face. Right, right. I show up every month. 
I didn't even feel like anything is wrong. In fact, I'm struggling on the line. Hey, I was here before you. You know, like, <laughs> that's what happens. No dignity, or you don't look at it negatively. No pride. It's the same thing. It's like self-esteem or something. So but there's a healthy, uh, healthy amount that we should have, which will make you, oh, I want to work. Oh, I want to earn this by myself. God puts that in us. A man that is working is fulfilled, is satisfied, right? Now, you can abuse it or underabuse it, or like unuse it, which is still abusing it either way, right? So they want to work. I remember, this is a long time ago, I remember I, was, I, I went to help my wife to pick up something in the food store, pro produce market, probably when she was pregnant or something. That's when I used to go shopping. <laughs> so I was there, and one guy came to me. I don't remember if it was a guy or a girl, but it was a long time ago. One guy came to me and was like, um, I'll pay for your produce. On the line, I'll pay for your produce, but you give me the cash. You know, I was thinking about it. I was like, how, how do I gain? Like, wh what's going on? I didn't even know what was going on. I was like, How's this transaction? <laughs> it's like, I'll pay for your produce. Then I looked at the card he was pointing at. I saw EBT. I just understood what was happening. This guy's a drug addict. He has to be. Because they gave him money for food stamps. He's supposed to go buy food for a certain amount. But all he wants is the cash so that he will pay for the food. He's not buying food. He'll go buy drinks, alcohol, and all of that. I was like, I'm not going to support that. I'm not going to help you. You don't have to pay for it. I'm, I'm fine. I'm, you're not paying for my food. I would pay for it by myself. <laughs> right? I, I'm not going to give you cash for you to go and you know go into drugs. That's what they do. Because it's the government that's giving them money. The government is not seeing them. It's just like, oh yeah, you don't make this amount of money. Okay. It's just a number. They just give them money. If it's a human being giving them money, they'll be like, whoa, look at your life. <laughs> How about I buy you this food? You know? So I'm just telling you, that was just one experience I had way back, and I knew that this uh, welfare system is just a horrible system. Now, relationships should be give and take. That's how relationships are. We help each other different ways. It's not only financially. So nothing is permanent. That's something that we will understand as a society that your, your level is not permanent. Anything can happen. Now, the blessings of God, they make it rich. They added no sorrow. Bible talks about uh, um, durable riches that he'll give the wise man, someone that fears the Lord. But understand still that nothing is permanent because if you start doing evil, you start doing wrong, you start living in sin, God can punish you, even if you're not. Look at Job. He lost everything. He lost everything. So you have to have respect for people. If Job looked down at everybody, everybody, punished everybody, just didn't care, he would not have friends that would come and sit with him. How many days was that? Is it three days or seven days? I don't know. He sat to, they just sat with him, saying nothing. Just quietly. Who has the time for that? For someone that was insulting me because he was rich, now that he has lost everything, They'll just leave him. So everybody has a healthy respect for every, everybody will have a healthy respect for everybody if the government is not supporting everybody or having a safety net for everybody. So it should be out of the hands of the government. Remember the parable of the unfaithful steward. The unfaithful steward did not say, you know what, I'm going to get unemployment. It's a, it's a story, you can read it. It's a parable of the unfaithful that Jesus gave. I'm going to get unemployment. If my boss fires me, if my master fires me, then that's fine. No. The unfaithful is like... I need to start helping people out. <laughs> hey, my master, oh, you owe my master this. Ah, uh, write it off, 50% off. Yeah, well, July 4th sales, you know, right? That's what your faithful steward did because he knew that those people are going to come and help him again. You see, it's not the government. And the Bible says, Jesus said we should be wise like that. We should be wise like that. But now we don't care about each other because the government is going to help us no matter what. I don't care. Like, I don't have to come to your house. I don't have to fight because if I'm homeless, I just file for something. File, file, file. See, no relationships. And we don't have those relationships, then church does not look that much important. It's true. I can do church online. I don't need people. I have the government. The government is my everything. It's my father. It's my house. It's my this. It's my that. It should be out of the hands of the government. It, it gives that false sense of equality. Everybody's all equal. Oh, oh, we have the same things. All of that. So that is a bad thing about the welfare system. Amen. So you say, so what is the right welfare system? Welfare, according to the Bible, three points. Point number one, provide for your own. Provide for your own. First Timothy 5, 8. We all know it. But if any... If but sorry, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. 
That's what God said. You're worse than an unbeliever. So provide for your own. Now, by the way, when the Bible, or when we're following the ways of the Bible, you say, what's the right way about welfare system? You don't just follow one part of what God says. You have to follow the whole thing for it to work. Right? Follow the whole thing. You say, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to send my children to public school, but you're doing all the wrong things. But just that one thing is what you're not doing. It doesn't work that way. Or you say, oh, my wife's going to be a stay-at-home mom, but you still send your children to public school. It's like, <laughs> it doesn't work. Your family is still being affected. So it is assumed that you're following the teachings of the Bible, all of it, as much as you can, what you know, you do it right. And this is the ideal. The closer you are to the ideal, the better it is for your life. Now, if you cannot fulfill the ideal, at least know that this is the ideal, but okay, you have these limitations. Then just know that those things are affecting you and continue to pray for mercy, that God will keep you and God will help you. Yes, you know, something has to happen. It is what it is, but God, I know I'm out of the ideal, but help me. So, so amongst many other things, the man is the head of the home, right? The breadwinner, and he's the one that wears the pants in the house, both literally and figuratively, right? And number two, uh, he's a benevolent dictator in the house. So then, he's to provide for his own, right? The closer you are to it, the better it is for you. So provide for you means take care of your family, take care of your extended family, if you are the next of kin. So take care of your, your parents, take care of your grandparents, if there's no one else available, you're the next of kin, take care of them. Because the Bible says, you know, the widow, if she has a son or, or a nephew, nephew in the Bible too is grand, grandchild, it's not always like nephew as it is, but, Either way, if you're the next of kin, you have to take care of them. And when I say take care of them, I don't mean, you know, they need to go on vacation to Paris or something to watch the Olympics. But they just, if they are homeless, anything that we need for them to go to the welfare system, make sure you have that covered. Whatsoever is welfare system, a decent standard of living, make sure you have that covered. So that's what that means. All right, so number one, God's standard is of welfare, of the well-being, of the prosperity of us is that you should provide for your own. Number two, help your neighbor in need and distress. Help your neighbor in need and distress. I'm going to give you many examples to explain this. But the number one is the, good, the story of the Good Samaritan. Say, so who's my neighbor? Somebody in need and distress that's next to you. <laughs> right? That's the story of the Good Samaritan. That is who your neighbor is. That is how God wants the welfare system to work. Somebody showing up, somebody helping. But the challenge is that, oh, but people, people will not help. In the good story of the Good Samaritan, a whole bunch of people, not a whole bunch, but a few people passed him and did not help. He's the last guy that no one expected, the Samaritan himself. Right? So people will not help. Instead of people helping, people will steal than, rather than help other people. And that's true. And God tackles that in his word. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, he specifically says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Yeah, people steal. God says, let him stop stealing, let him work hard, and let him give somebody that needs. That is welfare system. <laughs> so God understands that people will steal. It's God's own way of welfare system. You're not smarter than him. So you're not. So you're living in people's hands, even thieves. Yes, even thieves. <laughs> Right? So leave it in your hands. That's how God wants it done. So the feeding, the clothing, the visiting of people, the least in the kingdom of God, when you do that, the Bible says you're doing it unto the Lord. That is God's welfare system. It's in Matthew chapter 25. In James chapter 1, open to James. James chapter 1 verse 27, the Bible says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep him, and to keep himself, sorry, unspotted from the world. So those people that you say, oh, this, but we need the welfare system because there's the fatherless, the orphans. So who's going to take care of them? You! <laughs> it's, it's religion. That's what God wants. You take care of them. To visit the fatherless, right? In their affliction. That means you're helping them. We're still in James. Look at chapter 2, verse 15. James 2, verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, and be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? What is God teaching here? Help! It's the welfare system. This is how the welfare system works. 
right? So helping your neighbor, it's not just, I just first of all explained those that are destitute, right, for, of daily food, those that are naked, those that are in serious affliction, like the story of the Good, uh, uh, the good Samaritan, right? But there are others. Now, there are others that are just down on their log or something wrong is happening, right? So those are what the Bible refers to as the poor. Make the poor work for a living. That's how you help them. Open to Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy 15 verse 7. And when I say poor, again, these are people down on their luck. They are working hard, but they can't make ends meet. This is different from a lazy person. A lazy person doesn't want to work. And that's how he, becomes, he goes into poverty. So you have to consider the cause of the poor. Like, and that's why the government cannot, should not be the one giving the welfare. Because they're not considering the cause. They're just looking at, oh, he's poor, well, that's it. Everybody, war on poverty. How about war on laziness? We don't hear that one. So it's not all poor people, or just, just help them because they're poor. So you make them work. Check if they are, they are hardworking enough. And this is how God set up the welfare system in Israel, in the ideal society. Deuteronomy 15, look at verse 7. It says, If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanted. Beware that there be not a thought in thine wicked heart, it's interesting how Moses was talking. <laughs> but it's God saying this. Let there not be a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, the seventh year, the year of release, that's the year of Jubilee, the story is the year of Jubilee, everything is free, you know, everything is returned back. All your pro you don't get anything. Like, if you're getting rent, everything just returns back. So everything is a reset. You get back your land. If you sold it, you get back your land. Anyway. So let me read that again. I just wanted you to understand the year of Jubilee. But verse 9, beware that, there, that, th beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him not, and he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be seen unto thee. Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because... Because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. Why am I saying that? Oh, this is putting him to work. Open to Leviticus 23, by the way. Leviticus 23. This is putting him to work because you're, you're lending unto him. Thou shalt lend. You're not just, oh, I'm giving you this stuff free. It's just yours. No, no. You're lending unto him. He's going to have to work. He's going to have to pay it back. Right? And don't think, oh yeah, Jubilee is coming. How is he going to pay me back? I'm not going to get, get anything. You're lending unto him and forget about Jubilee is coming or the year of release is coming. Forget about that. Help your brother that is in need. That is God's welfare system and let him work for it. The mercy there is that you're lending without interest. Leviticus 23 verse 22. This one is very clear. 23, 22. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean readings of the corners of thy field. When thou reapest, Neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. What is God saying? You have a field. When you're reaping the harvest, that's when you're harvesting, putting in the sickle, getting in the wheat or anything, the corn, you leave some at the edge of your land. Leave some. Leave some at the corners. Why? So that the poor man will come and work for it. Him too, he will reap. <laughs> he will work for his food. He will go to this land, work. they will go to another one, work. So you leave some. And when you are, you know, taking in the corn, you know, some are going to be left behind. Don't go the second round or the third round to clean up everything or make sure I get every single one. Let them come. The, the poor people come and work and look for the ones that were left behind. It's not like you're intentionally leaving them behind. I know Boaz did that, but... Okay. That was a different, <laughs> different story. But it's like, this is a story of roots right here, right? So it's not like you're intentionally leaving them here. You're just walking, but some will be left behind. It's just how life is. Don't go back and say, I must sweep, clean everything. Let's move all the, the covers away. Make sure we get all the corns and all of that. You know, just leave it for the poor. 
Let them work hard. I mean, they, somebody might open up, open up after one hour, nothing. But, but God wants the poor to work. It's not just giving to them on the platter. Let the poor work, right? So it was hard work what Ruth did for Naomi. Naomi was happy with Ruth. Imagine without Ruth, uh, Naomi would have been hard pressed to find any living or to, to survive. So Ruth was actually very helpful. If not, Naomi would be out there working hard. It's just sad, but that's life. When, when Naomi came back, everyone's like, oh, Naomi, oh, look at you. What is going on? Naomi's like, oh, you know, I'm sad and all of that. All those people that greeted Naomi, the next day, did they come with food? Here's a check. Oh, Naomi, it's too bad for you. Nobody gave her anything. You're supposed to work. <laughs> but if it's now, you know, oh, the government to give this, that, that, that. It's just, just, oh, let's just help the person. It's, you know, it's too bad for you. It's just too bad. Go and work. Ruth had to go and work for them to survive. That is God's system. Naomi was not like, oh, all these people hate me. Right? Don't they see what happened? I came back. You know. She didn't see all of that. She was just happy, thanking God for Ruth. Elisha and the prophet's widow. Remember the prophet's widow? That the prophet died. The widow had two sons, and the sons were going to be taken into cap uh, say captivity to serve out the, the, the debt of their father. So the widow came to Elisha and was telling Elisha, help me, look at what's happening. My husband is dead and he had this debt and now my sons are going to be taken into... Was she saying, oh, they are wrong and it's evil? No, they had to work it out. So that's number one. What did Elisha say? Elisha was not like, oh, oh, that's just too bad. That's just, oh, that's, I'm so, it's so sorrowful. Uh, you should file for something. No, Elisha is like, in fact, let's read it. Just because Elisha's answer is like, okay, so that's normal. Let your sons go in. <laughs> she was just begging. That's it. So it's in Second Kings chapter four. I didn't plan to read it because I knew I'll be getting bad with time. Second Kings chapter four. I just wanted to show you Elisha's response when the woman came begging. Beginning of chapter four, he says, "Now there was sorry. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bond men. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in thy house? Like, how am I, how am I supposed to help you? Like, you have to do something." I can't just give you money. <laughs> right? That's what people might expect. Oh, Elisha, just give me stuff. Just, just help me. No, you have to work for it. What do you have? How can I bless you? How? This is how to help the poor. If she said, oh, I have absolutely nothing, I mean, something's wrong somewhere. <laughs> so, what do you have? Okay, uh, I have, thy handmaid had, uh, had nothing in the house, save a pot of oil. So she had something. Now with that, okay, now go get pots. Now pour that oil. The miracle, yes, God performed the miracle, but she had to work in order to come out of that debt, in order to survive, right? She had to work uh, to pay that debt back. It's not just, here's the payment of the debt and that's it. So God can do miracles. Don't get me wrong. The poor people that's hard on their luck, I mean, the husband would have paid back, but the husband died. The son of a prophet, he feared the Lord. But he died, it's unfortunate. So, but God will do miracles, but don't think it's just, oh, it's just free. Everything is just free. You have to work. Make the poor work. The other examples in the Bible, uh, the churches giving to other churches in need, uh, the beginning of, in the beginning of the local New Testament, they were selling their possessions. This is how God wants um, welfare to be done. So welfare done correctly, provide for your own, help your neighbor, and lastly, the role of the church. Open again to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 9. I believe the role of the church is the last resort. This is when all, you've tried every other channel, you cannot help yourself, your family's not there to help you, you cannot help, uh, no neighbors are there to help you, no friends are help you, I mean, it's rare, but it could possibly happen, especially to a widow. Then, um, because her friends maybe are dead or something, they are also widows, how widows help widows. So her family, she maybe, I don't know what happened, maybe they are dead too, I don't know. It could happen to a widow, and that's why the widow is giving us the example. So, but it doesn't still mean that, oh, because she's a widow, because she's in this situation, you're just supposed to help her. No, there are still conditions that have to be met in this final resort. Because I get calls, I get emails from people, and 
church email and I can show you if you if you if you want to see and they'll just say oh um, we are in a bad situation we need uh, housing if you can pay for rooms just for like, like a week or three days just to help us get on our feet I mean these are emails just random I don't even know the person <laughs> just send an email I just read the emails you know years ago I tried to answer it I'll be like oh yeah what church do you go to who are you it's a waste of time I just ignore the emails completely ignore it now some people are even bold enough to show up after church like church is over <laughs> and they time it perfectly too I don't know how after church oh yeah we ran out of gas do you have like $50 it's like <laughs> Right? This, see, it's not just give anybody, oh, this is charge, so it's, charge is just, just to be giving people money. Right? Because of the, I think the mistake, uh, 501c or 5031c3, I don't know what the number is anyway, where it's like a non profit organization, the government gives the church resources for the church to share to the society right so people just think all oh, churches are like that the government is giving you money you're supposed to give it to us so it's still the government it's not that they, they come to church or they, they respect the lord or fear the lord or are even saved so i get all those calls um, no they should go to church let the church look at the conditions and decide remember your family is supposed to help you if your family doesn't help you your neighbors people around you should help you because they know you i don't know the person so go to your church that knows you so that that church can help you. <laughs> but if you don't attend any church, you just think any church will help you, that's not what God means in the Bible. right? So go where you are known, and those are the people that are best positioned to help you. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 9. It says, Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man. Sorry, let me read that again. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, that is 60 years, having been the wife of one man, well reported. So how this English is worded is that if this widow or if this like, widow is under 60 years, she's not taken into the number. But those that be taken into the number, that is number to help them and support them. Those that be into the number is that they've been married to one man number one number two well reported for good works if she had brought up children if she had lodged strangers if she had washed the saints feet <laughs> you're like so pastor the women should be washing our feet <laughs> that was a cultural thing what do you mean by washing the saints feet when jesus entered the, uh, the pharisees house he said i was here you didn't wash my feet right so it's it, it's saying, you know, being hospital, uh, receiving people, things like that. It's a cultural thing, just like we don't kiss each other on the cheek, right? <laughs> so, if she had washed the saints' feet, if she had relieved the afflicted, if she had diligently followed some good works. No. Every good work. It's a very, very high, tall order here to be helped by the church. <laughs> very cold. You can't just show up after like one year and be like, oh yeah, I'm a widow now, start helping. I, I, I need housing. It's like, I, does this look like it's easy? <laughs> it's not easy? It means that this person has been in the church for years. That's how you know. For years, and the person has followed every good work, I mean, good testimony, all of that. So it's not just any widow. <laughs> It's a, it's a tough thing to, to judge and now to help because if not, the pastor will be held responsible. I, I don't just decide what I'm going to do with the money, God's money. It's God's money. Right. I'm just the steward for it. Okay. So I don't want to be an unfaithful steward or, or, or a bad servant of the Lord. And I don't play with God's money. All right, let's go back. We're almost ending here. So, but pastor, the Gibeonites survived uh, annihilation. I mean, they were not destroyed. They survived with their smartness. At what cost did they survive? And what kind of life are they living? Talking about their posterity. And imagine the bondage they created for their posterity. That's everlasting bondage to Israel, uh, under um, the Israelites, basically. So here, in my opinion, here's the best thing for them to have done. This is just hypothetically, and you understand. Let me just finish up. The best thing for them to do is they knew the truth that God said wipe out everybody in that land. God did not say go and find people that used to be in that land and wipe all of them out. <laughs> all they should have done is leave the land. Israel is coming to wipe us out. We know that their God can do it. 
All of us, let's go to another land where God did not tell them to possess. Leave the land, go and suffer in that land. So when you go to that other land, turn to the Lord. You know that he's the great God. He's the only, they knew the truth. They had the word of God. So they should turn to the Lord, believe the gospel, get saved. Or, I, I think those ones are reprobates, and I'll get to that. But believe the gospel gets I'm telling you what they should have done. If oh, they were so smart, they saved themselves. No, that's not the right thing to do. Because people think, oh, welfare, I mean, we're in America, so that's the right thing to do. No, you're putting yourself in perpetual bondage. All right, so talk to the Lord in that foreign land, you know. Then after Israel has settled, then your next generation, or maybe the fourth generation, I don't care, the tenth generation, they should start coming back to be part of Israel. And that's the smartest thing that they should have done. And they will be allowed, it looks like, to be part of Israel, like the other generations, who knows? And their later generations might even be allowed to be part of the church. Because yeah, you can be part of Israel, but it doesn't mean you're part of the church, that's the congregation. When it says the congregation, the house of the Lord, that's when they all come together. Anyway, but alas, these people were not going to do that. They used their worldly wisdom. And this is why God said that they should all be wiped away in the first place. I believe they were reprobates. They rejected the Lord. The Bible says they did all those abominations. So you read the story and they look like innocent people. Right? Some, uh, some, somebody that does not understand the word of God, that has not even read the whole story, will just read that chapter and be like, you see how God just wanted to destroy these nations? Just wanted to kill. This, look at these innocent people. They saw, they respected God, but God would have still killed them. No, they didn't. No, they were abominable in the eyes of God. They did all these abominations. That's what God said. They were not innocent people because of their sins. So they chose the bondage of perpetual welfare, which might be better for them, that generation. They are just extending the life that they will live on earth, but they are still all going to go to hell. But their posterity suffers. Their posterity might not be reprobate. Might not be, most likely uh, will turn out to follow their parents. But maybe there'll be one or two of them or three of them that will be like, oh no, God is the right God, right? I mean, we had time on the Canaanite. <laughs> become, uh, will become, or already is establishing the word of God, a ruler of the tribe, of one of the tribes of Israel. Simon the Canaanite. So you say, uh, maybe some of them might be saved, right? But they are under perpetual bondage, which is, which is what their parents set up for them. So obviously they were thinking about themselves. And those in welfare system, what are they doing? They are thinking about themselves, not their posterity. It's just, oh, how can I survive? No, work hard. Set up yourself. Let your child, let your posterity grow up in the right system, right? And at the end, they submit themselves to people trying to wipe them out. Saul later on tries to wipe them out, as we're going to see on Wednesday, God willing, when we study 2 Samuel 21. So you are not rejected of the Lord. You're not reprobates like them. You're not abominable like them. You don't have to submit yourself to the bondage of perpetual welfare. You don't have to do that. You have other options as a child of God. God is there to help you, right? And God is there to give you a comfortable life. Now, don't misunderstand me with this sermon. I do plan to get benefits because I paid for them. When I say benefits, any benefits that, is, uh, that I'm paying for, I'm not planning to submit myself and be a servant of men, right? But I will take advantage where opportunities show up, but I will not put myself in bondage. What do I mean? All right, so uh, I need all the names of your children. I, where are you going? How much do you I submit this, submit this? That's not the kind of benefits I'm going for. <laughs> Right? I'm, I'm not putting myself in bondage. They now decide how I live my life. Oh, you must send your child to school. Oh, you must do this. You must do that. You must do that. All because I want a check. Then you're submitting yourself. Or I reduce my income so much just because I want a check. You are putting yourself in bondage. But now, if they say, um, if you have, uh, every child gets, you know, during the COVID thing, every child gets, I don't know, I mean, $2,000 or so. Of course I'm going to, yeah, I have five children. <laughs> I need my money because <laughs> I pay for it. I'm not just going to be like, oh, no, no welfare. God may not give me anything. That, that's not what I'm saying. Make sure you get whatever you can get. Just don't be under bondage to men. Don't be under the perpetual bondage of perpetual welfare or the bondage of perpetual welfare, I should say. So now, unless it is inevitable, what do I mean? Evil befalling me. Maybe I become handicapped or I even die. If evil, but me still being alive, like if I'm handicapped, then it is what it is. I'll, I will use it. 
But if it's still ideal and I can work, to put yourself in perpetual bondage. You see what I mean? So, but before I use it though, I'll go through all God's channels. And I believe going through all God's channels, I will not need to go into the welfare system. You know, family, take care of your own, right? Neighbors, friends, I mean, uh, the uh, unfaithful, serv unfaithful uh, steward, right? <laughs> I'll help people take care of me too before I just submit my whole life completely to the government to be my master, boss, and God or father too. So if I have the option, I'll forbear paying, paying school taxes, unemployment taxes, social security, all those things. I'll forbear paying, paying all those things because I'm not looking forward to, oh, my social security, that's what is going to take care of me. No, I'm looking forward to all my investments. Look at them, they're growing. <laughs> Growing investment. That's what I'm looking forward to. And I'll continue to work and work, then my investments will take care of me. It's not even my social security. By force, I'm paying into, no, it's not by force, but I just don't want to look weird. If my company tell, tells me, oh, we're matching up to 6% or all that. That's the, um, what's it called again? Help me out. 401k. 401k, there you go. So 401k, I'm like, oh yeah, just I'll, I'll, I'll pay like 1%. They're like, 1%, are you sure? You know, like, yeah, 1%. Because I don't, they send me the thing monthly. I don't even look at how much I have. I don't know, and I've been paying for years. So I intentionally not look at it because I know people kill themselves in 2008 <laughs> because their, their 401k crashed, and people kill themselves, so I don't even know, I don't care, right? So don't, don't, don't suck yourself into all those things. If you ask me, I don't even want to pay for all those things. But because I'm paying for them, by force the money of social security is coming out, the money of all that, then I'm going to use it. I'm going to get my social security because I'm going to pay for it, <laughs> right? So when I'm old, that is if it's still available anyway. So generations have survived without these taxes. They survived without it. Now, I'm not saying all taxes are bad. See, I like good roads. You guys know why I like good roads anyway. <laughs> I like good roads. So the, I, I think we should all come together and pay for good roads. That makes sense. I cannot pay for the road all the way everywhere I want to drive. So there are some things taxes are good for, but it's abused. That's what I'm trying to say. Anyway. The welfare system started as a good thing, but it, it ends up how everything that's that so-called good, everything that starts off outside the will of God ends up. Example, the school system. School was, you know, looked at like a good thing. I mean, they were reading the Bible, they were praying, all of that in school, but it's now not no more a good, good thing. It's now abused by the devil. Roosevelt in 1935 instituted the welfare program uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson expanded it in 1965, which destroyed it, made it worse. So beware of the bondage of perpetual welfare. Don't abuse the welfare system that we have in this country. We should not let the welfare system cause us not to follow the system that God wants. Destroy relationships, families, even the church, even society, in the relationship with your neighbors. See. Godly welfare, welfare system means that we help each other, we build relationships, even here in the local church. So these are the things that are affecting the church, affecting how we serve God and the work of the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for your word. Thank you for teaching us. Open our eyes to the dangers of the welfare system, the bondage of perpetual welfare. I pray.